I think I was a very kind of a hyperactive kid. I was very intense. I was very, very, I was like a scream looking for a mouth. Oh, yes. See, I started to die 36 hours before I was born. So by the time I was born, I was pissed off. <laughs> I was angry, man. <coughs> and I've, I've been that way ever since. And as a kid, I, uh, I had a sense of indignation at what was going on in the world. See, when I was a kid, I was born in 1928. When I was a kid, they were still lynching black people from lampposts in the South. It's absolutely incredible. And some of the things they did, they just appalled me. I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. What is going on? It was, all these things used to upset me. How can you live in this world with that kind of sensitivity? You can't, you can't do it. You just can't. You have to find some kind of buffer. And at that age, it just isn't. Not in those days. I mean, an uh, eight, ten-year-old kid couldn't go out and get drunk. We couldn't buy them. Well, there was no money around anyway. <laughs> It was the depression. And I always felt inadequate. I was always overwhelmed with a sense of shame and guilt um, and all kinds of fear, but I never knew this. I had no way of knowing. <clears throat> but I just knew I couldn't do it. I couldn't live in my own skin and there was no way I could live in this world. But at the same time, I looked at some of my, of my friends as jerks. <laughs> they were stupid. They didn't seem to know things. Um, and I'm not, I don't mean like academic intellectual school, the things they didn't know. And I suspect I was right that they just, well, I'll tell you an example. When I was about seven years old, some kids were pulling bark off a tree. And I told them not to do that. I got all excited. Don't, don't do that. You make the tree cry. You know? See? You know, the sap is going to, you make the tree cry. And I was really upset. Well... Man, you can imagine what they said to me. Hey, you bet it's the trees cry. Hey, I mean, you know, so I don't. <laughs> so I stopped. I stopped that. I'd be afraid to step on ants because then their whole family would come home and get me. You know, I mean, I was, I was kind of, I was just in my own way a little wacko. I remember driving my poor father crazy. I didn't realize I was doing it. But I couldn't sit still, and we had to be at the kitchen table, and I'd be pounding with a knife and fork, like a boom, bang. And my poor father, who was an alcoholic, he was, oh, he's shaking. He, it was, so I don't know what kind, at the same time, I was um, affectionate, I was concerned, I always had an image of God with me, and that sort of thing, and I... And I desperately tried to be good. And it wasn't until like 50 years later that I realized that I must have thought I was evil in order to try so hard to be good. I had to. So I, and I used to follow my mother around. Was I a good boy today? Was I a good boy today? I was an only child, and this might be common for, for only children. I kind of felt almost like the battleground between my mother and my father. And it was very difficult because my mother hated booze, and my father was a hopeless lush. You know, he just a hopeless... He ended up dying drunk at the end, age of 78. I mean, it wasn't premature, but he died drunk. He drank a long time, maybe 65 years. I mean, he, oh, and he was a drinker, and he was a maniac. You know, he was a real maniac. But I loved him. I, I adored him. I worshipped him. And my mother, too. But I always felt like somehow I was supposed to take sides in their fights. And you know, that was rages. And I also realize now that I, I was in bed like this all when I was a kid. You know, wondering, is he going to come home? Is he not going to come? What's going to happen? I, I wasn't aware of that at the time. But I, I realize now that that kid was really terrified. But I, I idolized him. I thought he was the greatest thing in the world. I 
And the same with my mother. I thought she was the greatest person in the world. I just didn't know how to satisfy them both. I didn't know how to make it better. My father was an engineer, a stationary engineer. And even during the Depression, he always had the ability to have a job. But he didn't have the ability to get home with the pay. That was, <laughs> that was the problem. That, the drinking was the problem. But he always had the ability to, to earn a living. Because uh, engineers were always needed. And he then became an air conditioning engineer. So from that point of view, it was always possible. But at the same time, there were times during a depression where we'd have nothing. But I wasn't really aware of that. We always kind of ate somehow. My mother, my mother never poor mouthed. She never weeped the blues. She just somehow took care of business and make sure we got, we got fed. My mother was remarkable in many ways. Um, she would take my word for something over anybody else. Because I never lied to my mother. I mean, this is before puberty we're talking about, after that. My, uh, but if something happened, my mother asked me, did you do that, Hubert? And I'd say yes or no. And if I said no, then she'd tell the whole world he didn't do it. And she'd stand right by me. And she was great like that. She put her money where her mouth was. She was also very strict, um, disciplinarian, and that sort of thing. But she really did give me a sense of belonging as much as I could have, and a sense of seeing these principles in action. So she was a, a really remarkable woman. So when I was a kid, maybe eight years old, I wanted to be a bacteriologist. Only I didn't know that was the word. I called it a germiologist. <laughs> My ambition was to save the world from suffering. <laughs> oh, you know, it's amazing. And I suppose you could say it's a real ego trip for an eight-year-old kid, but I think, even now looking back, that I think that's something exquisitely wonderful that a child can have that kind of focus. It wasn't in, and this is depression. I wasn't thinking of getting money, getting, 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 getting. I wanted to save the world from suffering. That's, I don't know, I think that's remarkable. I don't know how that happened, but I love it. I love the idea. By the time I was 15, I couldn't stand school anymore. I could, couldn't stand anything. I was just, oh, in my insides, were always turbulent. So I, I just kind of stopped going. And I guess in those days, everything was so, so confused that they didn't notice people not going to school or something. You know, the war is on and everything. And all of a sudden, I couldn't go home. I just could not go home. I couldn't talk to my mother anymore. It was like, poof, I couldn't understand it. I remember so distinctly one day, standing across the street on Third Avenue in Brooklyn, from the apartment house in which we lived, looking up at the window, wanting to go home, but I couldn't. And then I just ran away. I ran away from home for like a whole hour or something. <laughs> 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 and I was just crying. I couldn't do it. And I'd go on these endless walks. We lived on 72nd Street. I had an aunt who lived on 20th Street. And I used to walk down to their house. I just I was so lost. Because all of a sudden, that point, uh, that not just the point of security, but the, the, the foundation of my life was no longer accessible or available. Now what the heck do I do? And now, of course, I don't know that's what's happening, but I couldn't go to my mother. That was my source of stability. That's the word I'm looking for. There was always stability with my mother. And now that was no longer available. And I'm not a stable child. I am just not, I never have been a stable child. So I'm lost in this world. I'm just absolutely lost. But I always idolized and adored my father, as I said. And he went to sea during the first war as a kid. And he was 16. 
And he sailed for a total, I guess, of 11 years, and then he came ashore, married, and so forth. And so I always wanted to go to sea. So at first I started working in New York Harbor on dredges and tugboats and things of that nature. And then I worked on oil barges going up and down the coast. And then I went, by the time I was 16, I was sailing to Europe. And I just loved it. I loved everything about it. And I just romanticized the whole, the whole experience. As it was happening, I'd be romanticizing, embellishing. Oh, it was wonderful. I just loved going to sea. I'd still do it if I could. So when I was 15, I had my whole life planned. I knew exactly what I was going to do. And at 18, it was all over. I had 10 ribs cut out, and I had a lung collapse, the piece of the other one cut out. And I was just so pissed off at life, God, whatever, anything. And I, all I could do was lie in bed. As a matter of fact, in order to pass the time, and you know, my mother would bring grapes and things. And in order to pass the time, before I ate the grapes, I would peel them and take the seeds out. You know, just anything to pass the time. So I started reading. Reading mostly shoot 'em ups, detective stories. I read them and read, read a couple of days, just and then somehow I started reading other books. I, somehow I joined a book club. You join the club and you get three free books. And I think you got, the free books you got were One Man in the Universe by Aristotle, Five Dialogues by Plato, and The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. So I, know, I joined this thing and I got these books. <laughs> I read them, but I had no idea what I was reading. <laughs> but some not, somehow that started something. And then so I started reading novels. And I started reading and reading and reading. And then, then this desire to write came about as, as a result of that. I couldn't imagine the future. And I think the only thing that kept me alive was my rage, my violent, violent, um, well, maybe not nature, but my violent personality at the time. And I found out something very interesting about that, and that is that the Latin word from which we get the English word violence means life force. So I can see well, that was probably, at least in my mind, at that moment, the only way I could keep myself alive, the only way I could animate the life force was with this all-consuming rage and shaking my fist at heaven.